24. To the Paerica is closely related Bushyasta, the yellow, the long-handed. She lulls back to sleep the world as soon as awakened, and makes the faithful forget in slumber the hour of prayer. But, as at the same time she is said to have fallen upon Keris Aspa, one sees that she belonged before to a more concrete sort of mythology, and was a sister to Knathaete, and to the Pa Evrekas, 25. A member of the same family is Gahe, who was originally that entity's bride, giving herself up to the demon, and becoming then, by the progress of abstraction, the demon of unlawful love and unchastity. The courtesan is her incarnation, as the sorcerer is that of the Yatu. So sort of the uh, way that people, that not only, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the Christians talk about Jezebel, spirits, although the etymology... Um, Aizbal instead of Jezbal, um, you know, calling worthless whore instead of uh, virgin of the Lord. Virgin of the Lord seems to be the end that they're going towards because that's what it, what the term originally was, and the Jews came up with a slander. But um, twenty-six. Death gave rise to several personations. Saura, which in our text is only the proper name of a demon, was probably identical in meaning as he is in name with the Vedic Saru, the arrow, a personification of the arrow of death. As a godlike being, the same idea seems to be conveyed by the Ishus Havath Akto, the self-moving arrow, a designation to be accounted for by the fact that Saru in India, before becoming the arrow of death, was the arrow of lightning, with which the entity killed its foe. A more abstract personification is Ithyago, Marsha Onem, the unseen death, death which creeps in unawares. Kind of makes you want to play the Metallica song Creeping Death, doesn't it? Asto Vidotas, the bone divider, who, like the Yama of the Sanskrit epic, holds a noose around the neck of all living creatures. His mythical, and it's closely related to Asto Vidotu. Uh, I mean, he is closely related to these are Esha on Buete. is a related entity, but his mythical description might probably be completed by the rabbinical and Arabian tales about the breaking of the sepulchre and the angels Bankir and Nekir. Mentioned in the Quran. Um, 27. In the conflict between the entities, well, well, let's just say the angels and the fiends, man is active. He takes a part in it through the sacrifice. The sacrifice is more than an act of worship, it is an act of assistance to the entities. Well, it depends on your context thereof, but. Um, Well, perhaps assistance to the angels, but um, God, uh, those entities considered to be gods, like men, need drink and food to be strong, like men. They need praise and encouragement to be of good cheer. Well, in the monotheistic 
in the monotheist idea, it's not that God has need, it's that we have need, but um, monotheistic, um, certainly polytheistic groups uh, tend to consider their um, what they worship as having needs or limits or something. Um, When not strengthened by the sacrifice, they fly helpless before their foes. Tis Turya, worsted by Apa Osha, cries to Ahura, O Ahura Mazda, men do not worship me with sacrifice and praise. Should they worship me with sacrifice and praise, they would bring me the strength of ten horses, ten bulls, ten mountains, ten rivers. Ahura offers him a sacrifice. He brings him, therefore, the strength of ten horses, ten bulls, ten mountains, ten rivers. Tisturia runs back to the battlefield, and the Apaosha flies before him. Now, can't we kind of see this as, you know, it's, it's not that God prays to these entities. It's not that God uh, makes sacrifice to these entities, that God communicates and provides them. Oh, you're, you're not going to have the power without this? Well, I'm going to make, I'm going to have this done. Um... So it's a little bit different. But it's not the same as people who are, I'm cutting myself and calling upon and all this stuff. Oh, I'm not worshipping them. Um, it's, it's not quite the same thing when you're the creator of things. Um, 28. The sacrifice is composed of two elements. Offerings and spells. The offerings are libations of holy water. It's an atra. You know, it's the Vedic hotra, right? Certain prayers and stuff are offered over it. Holy meat. The Nyazda. Uh, you know, it's placed on the drona. And the Haoma. Blast offering is the most sacred and powerful of all. By the way, Haoma versus Soma has... Um, there was a recipe with 57 more um, plant ingredients, you could say. Um, Haoma, the Indian Soma, is an intoxicating plant, the juice of which is drunk by the faithful for their own benefit and for the benefit of their ones they consider to be gods. It compromises in it the powers of life of all the vegetable kingdom. They mash up marijuana. They put in some opium sap and some ephedra juice. You know, this, this is the drink they're drinking. Um, so you can imagine where some of these hymns come from. Um, and why it's a special occasion. It's not like nowadays and um, drug addicts are using stuff all the time. No, it's... Uh, And soma is also thought to be just a term for intoxicating um, things. Period. Um, but the point of the sacrifice is it's the mentioning of the names and the formulas over making something what it is, like um, uh, Satcha Yama Puja, or uh, how do you say that word? Um, But, I mean, it's physically what it is, but it's what it is part of the sacrifice. Um, but it comes dedicated to whatever one worships, and then it gives that extra quality aforementioned. There are two haomas. One is yellow, or golden homa, which is the earthly homa, and which, when prepared for sacrifice, is the king of healing plants. The other is the white haoma, are Ga-Okerana, which grows up in the middle of the sea, Wa'uru Kasha, surrounded by 10,000 healing plants, and is by the drinking of Ga-Okerana that men, on the day of the resurrection, will become immortal. And, see, there's two things hinted at there. One, this idea of what you're doing worship-wise, it has its physical side, but it has this other side that you'll partake upon um, in the hereafter. 
these sacrifices and stuff aren't just um, for material benefit, they're for another, you know. Um, but it could also hint at some of the origin of some of the plants. Um, it's like, didn't uh, marijuana, for example, spread far and wide? Didn't the... Well, the fly agaric mushroom wasn't exactly so propagated as opium and mar marijuana and the um, well, ephedra sort of naturally, um, opium and marijuana, I think, are the only notable plants that were really cultivated and spread to the point where, you know, um, but there could be some lost plant that was, um, over harvested and went into extinction too. 29. Spell or prayer is not less powerful than the offerings in the beginning of the world. It was by receiving the Hunabur, Ahuna, Ba'iria, that Ormazd, confounded Ahraman, man too, sends his prayer between the earth and the heavens, there to smite the fiends, the Ka, Vareddas, and the Ka, Vareddis, and the Kiyadas, and the Kiyadis, the Zandas, and the Yatus. 30. It, you know, the, those are listening to enemies. Um, a number of entities that people might consider to be divinities sprang from the hearth of the altar, most of which were already in existence during the Indo-Iranian period. Piety, which every day brings offerings and prayers to the fire of the altar, was mentioned in the Vedas as Aramati, the female entity who every morning and evening, streaming with the sacred butter, goes and gives up herself to Agni. She was praised in the Avesta in a more sober manner, in the abstract genius of piety, yet a few practices preserved evidentiary traces of old myths on her union with Atar, the fire entity. Agni, as a messenger between what were considered to be gods and men, was known to the Vedas as Nara Sansa. Hence came the Avesta messenger of Ahura, Eryo Sanga. The riches that go up from earth to heaven in the offerings of man and come down from heaven to earth in the gifts of the entities were deified as Rakta, the gift Asha, the Felicity, and more vividly in Parende, the keeper of treasures, who comes on a sounding chariot, a sister to the Vedic Puramve, uh, the order of the world, the Vedic rite, the Zend Asha, was deified as Asha Bahista, the excellent Asha, and Parsi Arda Behest. One of the things that we can look at is, you know, to, that caused some confusion. That causes some confusion is in Afghanistan. There's um, one or I think it may be two. It may not still be two um, fire temples where the Hindus go and worship the fire and the people that people are going to call Zoroastrians. The Mazda Yasnahe, Zarathustrahe, um, Kanon Zardosht, um, they are people, 
that um, don't worship the fire. They worship in the presence of the sacred fire, but they don't worship the fire, or they don't worship some Thirty-one star Osha. It's the priest entity, you know. It's obedience. It's kind of like an archangel, much in the way that Ashma is the arch demon in that place. Um, he first tied the Baresma in the bundles and offered up sacrifice to Ahura. He first sang the holy hymns. His weapons are the Ahuna, the Eria, and the Asna, and thrice each day, in each night, he descends upon this Karshvara to smite the Eng Engramenu and his crew of demons. It is he who, with his club uplifted, protects the living world from the terrors of the night. When the fiends rush upon the earth, it is he who protects the dead from the terrors of death. From the assaults of Angra, Ma'enyu, and Vidotas, it is through a sacrifice performed by Ormazd as Azoti and Sraosha and as a Raspi that at the end of time Ahraman will be forever vanquished and brought to naught. We remember in particular in a reference to well, I mean, okay, uh, we, um, I particularly think about uh, Muhammad, how it says that Jibreel, and how other traditions, it's the blue bird, or, 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 or however it's phrased, um, that comes and recites the scripture that is learned by the prophet figure, and also doing rituals before the entity. Now, I'm not claiming the same sort of authority, but um, if you uh, have looked at what I've said about my Komsilha ritual, um, that this entity, some entity did a ritual for me, and I've remembered of the, uh, the, the ritual. Um, now, can I say for certain which variation of the names because of the Enochian tablet letters being different. Um, which would be preferable, or do you use all of them, or um, whatever works best for you, I guess. Um, but again, it's, it's an interesting thing. I'm not saying that, you know, it has any of the uh, merit of these sorts of things, but... Um, Thirty-two. Thus far, the single elements of Mazdaism do not essentially differ from those of the Vedic and Indo-European mythologies. Generally, yet Mazdaism as a whole look, uh, took on an aspect of its own by grouping these elements in a new order, since by referring everything either to Mazda, uh, Ahura, or Engra, And uh, as its source, it came to divide the world into two symmetrical halves, in both of which a strong unity prevailed. The change was summed up, uh, was summed up in the rising of Engra Enu, a being of mixed natures, who was produced by abstract speculation from the old Indo-European storm fiend who borrowed his form from the supreme God himself, on one hand, as the world battle is only an enlarged form of the mythical storm fight, Engramenu, the fiend of fiends, and the leader of the evil powers, is partly an abstract embodiment of their energies and feats. On the other hand, as the antagonist of Ahura, he is modeled after him, and partly as it were, a negative projection of Ahura. Ahura is all light, truth, goodness, and knowledge. Engra Ma'enyu is all darkness, falsehood, wickedness, and ignorance. Ahura dwells in the infinite light, 
Angra Ma'enyu dwells in the infinite night. Whatever the good spirit makes, the evil spirit mars. When the world was created, Angra Ma'enyu broke into it, opposed every creation of Ahuras with a plague of his own, killed the firstborn bull that had been the first offspring and source of life on earth. He mixed poison with plants, smoke with fire, sin with man, and death with life. Uh, particularly when you have polytheistic um, cultures, you had mythology, uh, you know, about like everything that came in practically. Like, this happened, so we have this mountain, and this happened, so we have this. And, um, 33. Under Ahura were ranged six Amesha Sventas. They were at first mere personifications of virtues and moral or liturgical powers. Well, it could be thought that initially they were names, and then, like, all those names with Ya. El, at the, you know, the, more simply, all and yah. You know, those angel uh, at the end of the term, forming the angel. You know, you have a term and then you have that suffix and it's an angel name like Daniel and all that. Um, so, I, you know, they weren't all angels. Some of them were like human beings or something, but our places. But as their Lord and Father ruled over all, the whole of the world, they took by and by each a part of the world under their care. The choice was not altogether artificial, but partly natural and spontaneous. The empire of waters and trees was vested in Haurvatat and Ameratat, health and immortality, through the influence of old Iranian formula, in which waters and trees were invoked as the springs of health and life. Well, it's, it's mentioning entities in a spiritual context at the very least, and perhaps worshiping entities of that, those things. Um, I'm not sure, sure this wasn't just the, the priest developing a strict ritual thing on top of it, but um, it's not the springs and the trees and stuff itself in what they call Zoroastrianism in its polytheistic, you know, Catholic monotheism sort of way of thinking. Um, more complex, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm drawing the analogy, I'm not saying that, you know, more complex trains of ideas and partly the influence of an of analogy, fixed the field of action of the others. Kshatra Vairya, the perfect sovereignty, had molten brass for its emblem as the entity in the storm establishes empire by means of that molten brass. The fire of lightning, he thus became the king of metals in general. Asha Vahista, the holy order of the world, is maintained chiefly by the sacrificial fire, became the genius of fire. Arma'ita seems to have become considered as a goddess of the earth. As early as the Indo-Iranian period, Nbahu Ano had the living creation left to his superintendence. Now, before Zarathustra and even the Indo-Iranian period, it could be said that Perhaps they made it into being considered, um, well, not those language terms, made it to be considered as gods, but maybe perhaps before that, um, they weren't. But certainly angels of this and that and the other are treated as gods in uh, various systems, say. Um, Thirty-four. The 
Amesha Smentas projected, as it were, out of themselves as many the Ebas or demons, uh, Asuras in the other. Who either in their being or function were most of them hardly more than dim inverted images of the very ones that were, were treated as gods. They were to oppose, and whom they followed through all their successive evolutions. Urvatat and Ameretat, health and life, were opposed to Ta'ure, uh, to Ta'uru and Za'ere, sickness and decay, who changed into rulers of thirst and hunger when Urvatat and Ameretat had become the Ameshaspans of waters and trees. Uh, one of the metaphoric ways that people can refer to is this idea, okay, God really, not, maybe, I, I'm not sure about the etymology of the word, but perhaps what they're saying is father, um, e either way, it's a metaphor, the person who um, directs the, the principle, the, the, the rules, and the skills, and, you know, um, perhaps passes on ability and authority or something. So therefore, you know, um, names of divinity, sort of this making oneness that you see in, mentioned in the Quran, it's that they're like, you should make you know to go to one. He's like, well, perhaps saying there's, an uh, he says there's angels that take part in these things, but yeah, there's not separate gods to worship here and here. It's got God is in charge of all this God we know through, you know, the earth, the air, the fire, and the water, and, but not, not using quite those terms. Um, the change in thirst and hunger were Havertat and Ameritat become the meshes, bands, and waters and trees. Vohu, Mano, Argutat was reflected in Akamano. Evil thought. Sa'uru, the arrow of death. Indra, the name or epithet of fire, is destructive. Na un ha'ithyua, an old Indo Iranian entity whose meaning was forgotten in Iran and misinterpreted by popular etymology. While well, they had different languages, and neighboring countries often you know, use their language to insult each other, you could say, um, were opposed respectively to Chatra Bairia, Asha Bahista, and Spenta Armaeta, and became the demons of tyranny, corruption, and impiety. <clears throat> then came the symmetrical armies of the numberless Entities and fiends, Yazatas and Dervants. So Yazatas are basically worshippers, um, and Yazdan as a side term is a term for the uh, worship worthy. So. Yazidi is a term that relates to that. But the Yazatas are more like spirits of the place, so they come off closer to a, a type of jinn than a type of malaka. So, um, monotheist re religions might. Um, call these demons, because at the early period, they weren't. It, it seems later that the Zoroastrians associated them on as really the same side as the whatever, but they're not. Um, 35. Or at least the way some people speak of it. Anyways, at 35, everything in the world was engaged in the conflict. Whatever works, or is fancy to work, for the cause of uh, for the good of man, are for his harm. 
for the wider spread of life or against it comes from and strives for either Ahura or Engra Ma'inu. And the Yazidi also talk about fire beings, you could say, the fire beings and the clay beings. The fire beings are the ones that are they're on the side of um so their Yazatas are not the uh same type of creation as the Ahuras. Um, they're beings of choice and all that. Uh, animals are enlisted under the standards of either the one spirit or the other. A stricter discipline prevails among them. Every class of animals has a chief Aratu above it. The same organization extends to all the beings in nature, stars, men. Those that are considered to be gods are perhaps in the West we would call them gods because the angels um, in most cultures in the West, we're calling them gods because angel worship is a very common thing throughout the world. Tisturia, Zoroaster, Ahura. Uh, Tisturia is thought to be the serious entity, sort of like the Osiris of the Persians. Or is it Isis? But, um, anyways, um, uh, sorry. In the eyes of the Parsis, they belong either to Ormazd or Ahraman, according as they are useful or hurtful to man. But in fact, they belonged originally to either the one or the other, according as they have been incarnations of the entity or, uh, well, they've either been manifestations for God are for the fiend. That is, they change to have lent their forms to either in the storm tales. In a few cases, of course, the habits of the animal had not been without influence upon its mythic destiny, but the determinative cause was different. The fiend was not described as a serpent because the serpent is a subtle and crafty reptile, but because the storm fiend envelops the female entity of light are the milch cows of the reigning heavens with the coils of the cloud as with the snake's folds. It was not animal psychology that disguised the angels and fiends as dogs, otters, hedgehogs, and cocks or snakes, tortoises, frogs, and ants, but the accidents of physical qualities and the caprice of popular fancy as both the entity and the fiend might be compared with and transformed into any object the idea of which was suggested by the uproar of the storm, the blazing cloud, the blazing of the lightning, the streaming of the water, and the hue and shape of the clouds.